Okay. Good morning. And thanks to Ilya and everyone else who's arranged this terrific conference at bar -Ilan. I feel quite humbled to be among the names that I see on this list. When I saw the call for constructing and deconstructing Jewish art, I felt that some of my ideas were relevant and connected, and I'm glad for the invitation. Some of the ideas that I'll talk about today, I also presented at the Connie Conference on Jewish Art that's housed at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I also have a book that's under review at Pennsylvania State University, which will also express some of these things. I'm also indebted to two people who are here, um, David Sperber and Devor Liss, for their kindness in sharing their ideas, either from afar or in person. Uh, and so I, I'm thankful to them. Today I'm going to ask this question, what is artistic and Jewish thought? And when I say artistic, what I really mean is contemporary methods of artistic expression, performance, installation, video, perhaps music. And so how does that group of artists find information from Jewish texts and then exhibit it in their work? So today I'm going to talk primarily about action, as you see here. This is a work by Alan Wexler. He's based in New York. He was trained as an architect and is perhaps more well known for his Sukkot than uh, this particular object. And here he's wearing spice box for Havdalah. This ungainly contraption is outfitted with a paper respirator, a series of plastic hoses, and store-bought spice bottles. You can imagine replacing any one of the spices if they go rancid or you don't like it anymore, or create your own blend for a seasonal effect, perhaps. His spice box is a far cry from the traditional one. Fine metal, high craftsmanship, hidur mitzvah, making it more beautiful. So what are Wexler's concerns? How are these boxes the same? Well, one is, in fact, quite different. You wear it, the other you hold. One is almost medical, while the other is ornate. The only thing that might connect them are, is the activity of smelling. In the one on the left, you don't see the spices. If you know the object, you know how it's used. I would argue that Wexler and many of the artists today that I'll show have internalized the avant-garde lessons of the past 60 years or so. The strategies they've learned are now second nature to them. It displaces some of the traditional artistic values that they might have received before. And the, the value I want to focus on today is action. Before looking at more contemporary Jewish art, though, I want to give some historical background on how artists used action. As you may already know, Harold Rosenberg in his famous essay, American Action Painters, looked to action as emblematic of the abstract expressionist paintings. He described this in 1952. He said, at a certain moment, the canvas began to appear to one American painter after another as an arena in which to act, rather than as a place to, to reproduce, redesign, analyze, or express an object. What was to go on the canvas was not a picture, but an event. Jackson Pollock, who laid his canvas on the floor, painted by dripping and spilling the paint across the surface. As Rosenberg saw it, the paint recorded the physical motions of the artist. The area became an arena. Later, artists generalized Rosenberg's interpretation and Pollock paintings. Alan Capra, seen here, a performance artist, created the idea of the happening. If an artwork is made by an action, he reasoned, any action could create an artwork. So whatever he's doing here, tossing tires around, is creating or performing an artwork. Capra described Pollock's paintings like this. The Pollock image, therefore, is at some point an immediate re reference to the action that created it. And this, in the mind's eye, amplifies what is on the canvas into a far more complex theme, amounting for the observer to a recreation of the whole circumstance. Extending the logic of Rosenberg and Pollock, Cabra argue, argued that artistic activity should not be separated from the result. Putting paint on a canvas, canvas leads to a painting, but a happening doesn't lead to any result. In a, in a real way, you had to be there. Of happenings, he wrote, a happening is always a purposive activity, whether it's game-like, ritualistic, or purely contemplative. Having a purpose may be a way of paying attention to something that is not noticed. Purpose implies a selective operation for happenings, limiting it to certain situations. Capro stressed that the performance didn't need an audience. It shouldn't ever be repeated. It shouldn't become something like a dance or a concert. It's a once-time once performed activity. 
Later, some artists looked at the purposelessness of happenings and Capro's vague call to attention to commonly overlooked things, and they didn't like it. It wasn't enough. Nevertheless, they continued the practice of using non-traditional methods, non-traditional performance in their work, and then sought out activities that had meaning for them. Here's Mira Lederman Eucalys performing or making Hartford Wash. In this picture, the artist is washing the outdoor stairs leading to the Hartford Athenaeum in Connecticut. Washing the floor was something Eucalys did, she said, as a housewife. In Hartford Wash, she connects that type of housework to art making. However, unlike Capro, who did not assign meaning to his actions necessarily, Eucalys self-consciously tells us that washing the floor is maintenance work. Her art is a maintenance art. That's the title of one of her artistic essays. Jessica Weisberg, a writer and editor, recounts an interview with Eucalys and the conflict between, between being an artist and a housewife. Weisberg writes, later when Eucalys became interested in boredom when she became a mother. She said, I had become an artist to live a life of freedom. I would have run a mile away to avoid repetitive tasks. I would avoid anything that wasn't my work, meaning her artwork. When she and her husband had their first child in 1968, she started to compound these two things, the repetitiveness, the, the boring quality of housework, and turned it into this performance, among others. So far, we've seen action in several ways. The Pollock painting is a record of an event. Capro says, you don't need a record. The event itself is enough. And Eucalys said, an action needs to have some sort of meaning. It can't be just anything the artist decides. Another way to look at action is to consider it as following rules. Here is a work by Solowit, wall drawing number 260. Solowit is a conceptual artist who's well known for these drawings. He would provide instructions to galleries and museums that, for other people then to create the work. He wanted to avoid the hand of the artist, the individual expression of abstract expressionism, and other things like that. Here, the subtitle of the work lets us know how the work was made. The subtitle is, on a black wall, all two-part combinations of white arcs from corners and sides, and white straight, not straight, and broken lines. <coughs> First, you map out a grid, and within each of those squares, you put those combinations of marks. The Museum of Modern Art's website that describes this piece goes a little further and says that Lewitt, quote, creates a score like music that might be played by musicians for generations to come. The concept, or the score, remains constant, but the wall drawing changes. What's the artwork? The instructions that are then applied. In my book, currently under review, I argue that Jewish thought has specific things to say about all four types of actions. Jewish thought has something to say about actions that accomplish or add to something, actions that do not accomplish anything, actions that have meaning, and actions that come from following rules. At the same time, this cluster of views of action has a lot strong connection to artistic activities, like Pollock. It is in this link, the idea that both Judaism and contemporary art examine a range of actions, and their meaning comes from that interaction. So, what's artistic about Jewish thought? With these approaches in the back of our minds, let's take a look at some objects. This brings us back to Wexler. The action that the contraption makes us perform. His actions are not arbitrary like Capro's. They don't leave a trace like Pollock, but they might have something to do with Eucalys. The action has meaning, and he invites us to perform that action. It's also an action that's rule-based. Havdalah has a particular ceremony. Let's look at a few motifs. Process following rules, ritual daily performance, uh, practice, excuse me, and performance. Obviously, these mo motifs overlap and they're not mutually exclusive, but for today, looking at one at a time is helpful. First, process and following rules. Undoubtedly, you can think of a ritual that's rule-based. You have to do something correctly in order to perform it. How about this? When two complete walls form a corner and an incomplete wall of at least one hand breadth is perpendicular to one of the complete walls, etc. Where does this come from? If I'm not worried about building a kosher sukkah, and I'm an artist or designer, I might find this rather appealing. Here is a set of rules, or a, I'm sorry, 
set of rules that I can follow that then create an object. And in Sukkah City in 2010, this set of Talmudic rules was circulated to designers and artists. What resulted was, were objects that followed the rules. They have three walls. The walls come close to the floor. But in this object, the walls do, are not parallel. So if they're not parallel, that rule becomes, well, not so important. So Ila Design Firm took the rules to a point where the sukkah is nearly unrecognizable. But all the rules have been followed, even though it's askew. The walls themselves are made out of netting that extend up beyond the junction in the middle and become a container for the or organic matter holding up the skach. What do we have here? We have a non-traditional design. We also have a new perspective on religious rules. Instead of thinking, I've got to get it right, the designer who is accustomed to negotiating client needs, building codes, budgets, the laws of physics, and their own expression all wound up into this object. Intention is one possible solution to the sukkah when thought of as a design problem. Talmud is read as if it were a call for participation. Sukkah City was not the first sukkah competition. The earliest one I could find was from 1997. Festivals of this kind have been held in Toronto, Canada, fairly consistently since 2011. This design was for the Indiana Sukkah Project. Joe Dowdle and Andre Swartz designed this more traditionally shaped one, but focused on the joinery to suggest the dismantling and the carrying. Alan Wexler, who we mentioned already, has created these two other sukkahs. The walls, tables, and chairs for the one on the left are put together like um, a paper toy, easily dismantled and then recreated. Garden sukkah on the right takes its influence as the temporary shelters farmers make, or today, a garden shed. This, uh, the building can be wheeled around like a wheelbarrow. There are hooks and places for gardening tools within. The roof retracts so that you can see the sky. I'm not sure how proper it is, because it can't really be taken apart so easily and then rebuilt the following year. For rituals, a different approach. Their artists are not necessarily looking at Talmud as a call for proposals, but they're looking at performance, or performance on a schedule, a ritual. Jewish artists are not the only people who do this. Here we have On Kawara, who made a series of today paintings. Each day he painted that day's date. He started these on January 4th, 1966, and continued them till his death. If any painting has more or less significance than any other, it's not because of the painting. It's because of what happened on that day. So these paintings acquire meaning after they're finished, which I think is rather fascinating. So he set up this daily ritual for himself. Some artists look to the schedule of Daf Yomi, studying a page of Talmud a day. Here is Jacqueline Nichols, who's in the middle of this rather long series. She's not illustrating the Talmud. She's not educating us through the picture, necessarily. I think she's more doing her own study, her own learning, and this is one expression of that. I asked her if she thought of this as some sort of endurance project, as an endurance artwork, as a whole. And she was content with that description, but it's also this daily practice. It's not the only daily practice she did. Other people, including herself, look to counting the Omer as a daily ritual over a much shorter period of time. So On Kawara, who did it for the rest of his life, and that was the end, uh, counting the Omer is much more limited as a beginning and an end. This cycle shows portraits of colleagues and acquaintances that she has. And then she asked them to show her what was in her, their pockets, what they carried around with them. Unlike the other works we've seen, Nichols's artwork is made on a schedule, at least these examples. Action is not represented by the picture or the technique, necessarily. Rather, the viewer's knowledge of Daf Yomi, or the counting of the Omer, is called upon to understand the series. A third example is Donnie Silver Simon's Omer painting. She has other work that's very similar. She lives in California. Here she counts the days with marks on the canvas. The groupings begin on the upper, upper right. Contrary to convention, at least in America, the marks are not grouped in fives, but rather run undifferentiated in each group up to 49, uh, the, that last line. Looking to performance. 
Now, when I think of performance, I think of an artwork that someone must do something in order for the work to be complete. It's either the artist performing and we see the action, or the artist invites the viewer to do something while with the work. And for these examples, I turn to Ken Goldman. Here is his Ruta, the practice of studying in pairs. Oops, excuse me, I'm working on two machines. Where the setting is the seesaw, the wood and the steel and the lecterns uh, rocking back and forth as these two men learn together. What does it connect to? Well, the Act, the intellectual activity, certainly, the playfulness that's in Talmud, the competition of ideas that might exist in the rocking back and forth, or even the physical activity of prayer in another setting or even in this setting. Goldman calls this performance. So if the artist is inviting us to use it, I recommend that we do the same. It's not just an object, but a scenario that the viewer can also participate in. Similarly, he performed this work. <laughs> This is a still photograph of an action. The artist cut his hair and shaved his head, as you see, to give the appearance of the kippah. I asked him how long he wore it, and he said, until the hair grow out, grew out. And he, see, he also seemed a little surprised that he also said that no one quite noticed that he'd done this. I'd also asked him if this had anything with Gideon Ofrat's comment, an Israeli curator and critic, about the artist, modern artist, needing to remove his kippah before entering the studio. I'm indebted to David Sperber's article, Israeli Art Discourse, for that piece of information I otherwise wouldn't have come across in America. And Goldman also acknowledged that that was a reference that was happening here, with, without, being Jewish in the studio, not being Jewish in the studio. So we've seen several different types of actions. Counting, marking, objects that invite performance, performance itself. And therefore, when you look at this kind of work, I implore you to think about what is artistic about the Jewish thoughts that these artists are inquiring. What did Silver Simon understand of counting the Omer? Why did she need to mark the surface to get that done, while Nichols interviewed people and asked them what was in their pockets? What artistic influences do they accept to, in, to inform their reading of Torah? I suggest some of the historical influences I talked about earlier might be good contenders. Goldman's kippah in truth is not just thumbing one's finger at a, a critic. It is, in fact, a direct challenge to all of us to ask this question of action and meaning. Contemporary art over the last 50 years has opened up innumerable methods, obviously. But how do these new ideas lead to new visual and active interpretations of Jewish texts? What is artistic in them? And just to show where these ideas started from, they started from my own work. Here are two of them. The one on the left is an Eruv painting of a local Eruv. <laughs> the one on the right is this DIY project of buying at a dime store or a dollar store a piece of string to set up your own. Pick it up before you go home for Shabbos. But, all over, uh, but overall, I hope what I've talked about has shown that we must not only ask what is Jewish about these works, we also must ask what is artistic in Torah. Thank you very much. Since unlike me, he held to the time, we have time for questions. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, I'm Yael. Um, I study here. I'm studying my first degree in, um, in Jewish art. And um, I actually started teaching art, uh, visual art, in uh, high school. And the kids, they find it um, really fun. But I want, I, want to, I want to try doing that. I want to try bringing somehow by not making, I mean, by not making um, value of you know Jewishness and you know kusha and you know hol the holiness of the actual um, um, uh, the subject, but to try and make Judaism interesting by like the creativity that goes into those kind of things. Like, I think that the kids would love that, like especially teenagers who have a, a hard time. Sometimes Judaism, you know, it's like 
more, I don't know, like all these things that are like so, it's like so clever the way that you can connect to it through art. So I don't know, like, do you think that these sort of things you can bring into the high schools and Great question, and a big one. I think you can, and I would follow the lead of the artists. Look to see what's happening at the biennial here. Look to see how artists are following rules to make Sukkot, and then approach it as this, well, it's not practical, <laughs> but as a design challenge. And that might engage them differently than saying this is a holy activity. You know, so. The link, yeah. And that's what many of these artists are seeking beyond their own uh, individual uh, points of view. Fact, a lot of religious things that we, and, and secular, find religiosity and you know, all these you know, subjects boring. Right. <laughs> and I think that if you, you bring you know, this type of you know, sort of make, combining art through it, I think that it, it, can make, it can make it so much more interesting. Let me know what you decide to do. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Well, I'm curious uh, about your own opinion of the relationship, uh, using the Solowit as an example, between prescription and enactment. Uh, where, in fact, does the art reside? And I guess it's, it's the difference, too, in, in music or theater between script or score mm -hmm. and performance. And with performance, art becoming increasingly important, and, and we heard about that in, in Ziva's talk, too. Uh, I'm wondering about your own take on whether we should care about that distinction. It seems important to you in the way you've laid out your category. Right. That brings up one of the questions from an earlier session about being accepting the Jewish law or making your own. And when you accept the Jewish law, whether it's just this call for action to make a sukkah, you're still using that content. And it's the artist, even though is making an impractical sukkah, when it isn't necessarily uh, appropriate or useful, it's the content is still there. So that's where the, some of that push might be. Um, for me, there is no difference between one set of rules and another. That's my view as, a, as the artist. But as the critic or the art historian, that question suddenly becomes very powerful. Is the, art, is the artist willing to give up some control and accept some other rule? And that's where the excitement or problem arises. And it also, especially if the rules are alike, You're right. uh, that imposes an additional um, burden of uh, acceptance or sure. acknowledgement. And, but for some of the designers who aren't Jewish and then are big, given these rules, that isn't there for them. They read it and they think, oh, what an interesting design challenge. So the Jewish artist has to say, oh, what an interesting design challenge. Be willing to put that other question aside, at least temporarily. Okay, and anyone else? I would be interested in the question that, that all the artworks you showed, at uh, the beginning of the, 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 the artworks you started with, I'm sorry, were um, what we would call um, at a universal perspective. You know? Although you could interpret them as typical Jewish or influenced by Jewish thoughts or Malaka or whatsoever. And then the uh, second part of the works you showed were explicitly particularistic. Yeah? So where you have to know the background, actually. Yes. And, uh, without them, you wouldn't understand them. So is it necessary to, to make this division or not? That would be my question. Or is it sufficient to know that there is a system behind and it doesn't matter which system this is, be it a Jewish one or not? I think it's necessary. And I think it's necessary not only because that's the content of the work, but it's a turn towards, for lack of a better word, iconography. Action is the wrong word for action. But if, we turn, if these artists are looking for content, they're expressing that content in contemporary ways, through conceptual art, through performance, and those, a content that is shared by others, I should say. All artists, I believe, make their own content and express their own values or, exp or experiences in their work. And to understand individual contemporary artists takes a lot of work for the critic or the art historian. Jewish art has content that's provided. Yes, the artist can then add to it their own experience and whatever. But once you have this shared knowledge, you have a shared resource. And I think the works act on both levels. 
and that shouldn't be avoided. I think it's richer when it's actually engaged. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you for putting a new dimension into uh, what we deal with. And would you please let me know when your book comes out so, <laughs> so I can buy it. Wonderful, thank you.